In today's video, we're going to take you through the building of a Softrock Lite 2 um, software defined receiver. Now, it's a very simple receiver. Uh, you can see it's just a, a handful of components here. Uh, and it basically is designed for ham radio bands. Uh, and it can be built for either 160, 80, 40, 30, or 20 meter uh, frequency bands. And uh, basically what it is is a, a small front end for a software defined receiver. Here's a simplified block diagram of this kit. There's a power supply section which is a simple uh, linear voltage reg regulator to go from 12 volts in to 5 volts out that uh, is used to power the rest of the circuits. Uh, there's a crystal oscillator, a simple Colpitts crystal oscillator. There's a pair of quadrature dividers uh, because the process of uh, creating the quadrature outputs is we create a pair of quadrature clocks that are then used to uh, modulate a pair of mixers. The other input to those mixers is the RF signal uh, coming in through a bandpass filter and a splitter being fed to both mixers. Those are being fed with the quadrature clocks coming out of the dividers and that results in uh, essentially baseband quadrature signals I and Q coming out the left and right. So what we're going to do is build each of these sub circuits uh, independently and test them independently so uh, we can see how each of those operate and then we'll take a quick look at uh, the quadrature outputs uh, with an RF input you know kind of from end to end to ensure it behaves as we a expect. A detailed look at the schematic and uh, each of the shaded areas are the various blocks that we talked about on the block diagram. You can see the regulator, the power supply is a very simple uh, LM78L05 low power 5 volt linear regulator to give us our 5 volts that we're using to drive uh, or to power up the remaining active circuits. Our uh, Colpit style crystal oscillator is right here. This design is actually very similar to the crystal oscillator test circuit that I built uh, a couple of videos ago. Uh, this uh, circuit here are, is the divide by four quadrature divider. It takes the RF input, the oscillator uh, as an input and then the divider is hooked up as a, a synchronous divide by four uh, divider with two outputs and those two outputs are 90 degrees out of phase and that's uh, we call that uh, quadrature clocks. Those quadrature clocks are then fed into this device down here, which is really nothing more than a pair of, uh, it's a set of um, demux and mu uh, multiplexer, demultiplexer uh, FET switches, but uh, effectively a switch can be used as a mixer. So that's what this is being used as, is a pair of mixers that are using the quadrature clocks to modulate or mix the uh, RF input. The RF input's coming in through here through a bandpass filter, through a splitter, and then being applied to both mixer inputs into this chip. The output of the mixer are, 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 are raw I and Q signals that are then um, uh, being essentially low pass filtered and amplified out with these op amps to create the left and right audio outputs. Uh, first sub circuit we'll build is the power supply. So uh, just a protection diode to prevent uh, you know, damage if you hook up the power supply backwards and a LM78L05 low power uh, linear voltage regulator to give us a 5 volt output and a couple of capacitors to uh, ensure good quiet operation and good stability in the uh, power supply. Start off by gathering so all the parts for the power supply uh, the regulator, the diode, and a couple of caps. Uh, one of the caps is a surface mount one and we'll mount that to the board first and that actually goes on the underside of the board uh, mounted right here. When doing surface mount parts I usually like to uh, tin one side of the the board. I'm going to do the uh, this side right here, get a little bit of solder on that uh, lead or the land and we'll also put a little flux uh, down on the board. It really does help when it comes to doing some of the surface mount stuff. It makes the uh, solder flow a lot better. And then we'll, uh, we'll grab the part and we'll lay it down on the board and uh, solder in that end where I've got the, uh, the solder in place that'll make it nice and easy to put in the other side. So with that side uh, soldered and in place I can just uh, reach in here with the, the solder and do the other side. So I can do this without blocking too much in the front of the camera. 
Okay, we can install the rest of these uh, these parts for the power supply. We'll put the uh, capacitor in place, uh, the other capacitor here in place, and uh, the protection diode in place, and the voltage regulator. I'll do. Okay, with all those leads uh, soldered in place, let's go just trim off the excess here. And I just put my finger typically over the top of the lead here to keep it from flying okay, away. Okay, test the power supply. We'll hook up uh, a variable DC supply to the power input right here. I've got uh, this meter here hooked directly into that power supply so we can measure how much voltage we're applying. The output of the regulated supply on the soft rock uh, can be measured right here. And I'll uh, just reach over and start turning the uh, DC power supply up. And uh, on this meter, again, we can read how much power we're applying. So we can see um, as I bring the voltage up here, uh, the output of the power supply is climbing. And this is a 78, uh, you know, low power, a 7805. So we're going to have some dropout. Uh, so we're not going to see any 5 volt regulation on the output until we get up to about 7 volts or so. So we can see when I'm up at about uh, 7, 7.3 volts, I've reached 5 volts here. And when I keep increasing the input of the supply, I'm up at 9.5 volts, we're still at 5 volts output. I go all the way up to a little over 12 volts here, we're still at 5 the volts. The next uh, section we're going to build is the crystal oscillator, or the local oscillator. This is uh, effectively a direct conversion receiver. So the local oscillator is effectively going to... Uh, determine what frequency we're going to be looking at. Remember though that we're dividing this down with a quadrature divider. We'll talk about uh, that a little bit more later. But it's basically just a, a coal pit style uh, crystal oscillator, the crystal right here. And then that's uh, buffered by a, uh, another transistor here which goes off into uh, our divider. So, uh, so it's basically the oscillator and a uh, common emitter PNP uh, amplifier as, a, uh, as an output buffer. Okay, now with the uh, local oscillator built, uh, we'll go test it. And uh, you know, after a visual check, and if you want to make some uh, voltmeter checks, you can, but we'll just jump right into it and uh, measure the output frequency of the oscillator. I'm just going to probe uh, the output of the oscillator here right at the top of R17 uh, with the scope. So I've got uh, power hooked up uh, right here. I'm probing the top of uh, R17 on the board with the scope. We'll take a look at the output over here. So I'll flip my power supply on. And I can see the output of the oscillator. Didn't really expect it to be sinusoidal, but that's okay. And we're seeing a frequency of uh, 13.497. Uh, it was nominally to be 13.5 megahertz, so that's uh, very close and uh, about what I expect to see. Now, if you don't have an oscilloscope or you don't have a frequency counter, uh, you can uh, verify that it's oscillating uh, by using a, uh, a shortwave, re shortwave receiver uh, like this one here. If I turn the volume up on this receiver, you can just hear a beat note. If I change, I'm on single sideband, so if I change the uh, the BFO, we can actually hear that's actually the this local oscillator radiating and being picked up by the receiver, and we can tell that for sure if I turn the uh, the circuit off. That signal went away. Now you might wonder how is a 13.497 uh, megahertz local oscillator going to be used? as the yellow for a direct conversion receiver for a 30 meter or 10.1 megahertz receiver. And uh, here's what's happening. So the divider that we're going to go build shortly is actually a divide by four. So we're going to take that uh, 13.497 megahertz uh, oscillator frequency and divide it by four. And uh, then what we're going to do is just uh, you know, by selecting the right mixing component, uh, work with the third harmonic of that signal. So we multiply that by three, and that gets us to 10.123 megahertz or so, and that'll basically give us that'll be the center of the tuning range that we're going to get in the soft uh, software-defined so, receiver. Uh, so far, we've uh, built the power supply, we built the local oscillator. Next thing we're going to do is put together the divider, which is just uh, a pair of D flip-flops that are being used to uh, basically divide by four and create a quadrature set of outputs. And that's also going to go down into the mixer, which is really just a MUX-DMUX uh, switch. 
but since both of these are surface mount ICs, uh, we're going to mount them all at the same time. Soldering so. these little uh, surface mount uh, chips can be a little tricky, but there's a, a couple of little tricks you can employ. Uh, I, I like using flux. It definitely makes things easier. It makes the solder flow a lot better. So we'll flux the leads. And uh, the other thing I like doing is putting a little solder on one corner, one of the corner uh, pins here first. So we'll just pick this one right here, lay a little solder on that pad. And uh, that'll make it easier when I uh, go to place the chip. I'll solder that corner in first. And uh, with that corner soldered in, uh, we should be able to uh, line the, uh, the part up with the rest of the pins. So I'll lay it on the board here and just touch that one and uh, try to get everything all lined up at about the same time. So now with that one pin locked in place, uh, all the other pins are sitting there, sitting in the flux, waiting to be soldered. And uh, what I'll do then, typically, is I'll go through and solder a diagonally opposite corner. And uh, with that one now soldered in place, the, the chip is really kind of locked down in place. And now I can go uh, pin by pin and uh, solder each pin in place. And uh, the part's not going to move on me. Okay, so we'll uh, test this divider out, be sure it's working okay. We'll take a look at the signal from the local oscillator, which should be our 13.497 uh, signal coming into pin 3 and pin 11. And then we can look at our divided by 4 clocks, should appear on either pin 6 or 12, as well as on pin 8. And those should be one quarter of the frequency of the input clock, and these two should be 90 degrees out of phase. So uh, I've got the circuit set up here. Let's first take a look at uh, the signal from the LO. And if we take a look at that, uh, we can see on the scope, uh, there's our signal, 13.497 megahertz. So that signal should be divided by four down here on pin six. And there it is, 3.375, or just about 3.374 megahertz. So there's our divide by four. And if we probe pin eight, that should be also divided by four. Uh, but this time shifted by 90 degrees. And we can see that uh, the clock is shifted by a quarter cycle, uh, so that is uh, 90 degrees out of phase. I've gone ahead and installed all of the uh, uh, circuits or the components for the, uh, the audio drivers and the uh, audio filters or baseband filters, the two op amps and all these passive components. So we're just going to do a quick uh, DC check to be sure that everything biased up right. Uh, both of these op amps are referenced to essentially a rail splitter here. So we'll have 5 volts here. That should be 2.5 volts. And with no signals going in on anything, both the inputs and the output of each of these uh, should be at about 2.5 uh, volts or half the supply rail. So let's go take a quick look at that. So if we, uh, let me see, reach over here and uh, we'll go to ground with that uh, probe there. And we can just go probe uh, the uh, inputs and outputs of these op amps. So pin one, there's about two and a half volts. Pin two, two and a half volts. That's the uh, two inputs to the op amp on one side. And then, uh, let's see, pin three, about two and a half volts there as well. So that's one of the op amps. I'm going to switch hands here and uh, grab the other uh, op amp here. And we've got uh, two and a half. Two and a half and two and a half. So the next and really final assembly step is to put together the bandpass filter and splitter. And it really just consists of two capacitors, an inductor, and a toroidal transformer to provide uh, equal outputs to the uh, quadrature mixers. Uh, the components that are used uh, in the bandpass filter are selected depending on which band you want to use. And for the 30 meter uh, Band, the 10 megahertz band, be a 68 picofarads, a thousand picofarads, a 3.5 microhenry inductor, which is 31 turns on a, a T30-6 toroid, and then the uh, the inductor, which is uh, eight turns and four turns, uh, pi filer wound. So uh, we've got those uh, the wire here is a 30 gauge uh, enameled wire, and we've got a pair of these. Uh, the T30-6 toroids. Now in winding a toroid, whether it's an inductor or a transformer, each pass of the wire through the core 
is considered one turn. So that would essentially be one turn out of the 31 that I need to do on this core. I also find that sometimes these cores, especially these small ones, you know, are kind of tough to hold while you're doing this winding. So I find it easy to use different types of fixtures. And uh, one handy one is just to use uh, the end of a uh, tapered rod. This actually is an old uh, chopstick. And uh, you can use that to you know, hold, the, hold the, uh, the toroid while you're addressing the wire and bringing it around. And uh, each time we pass a turn through here, uh, we can then uh, use the, the rod to kind of hold things in place as we, uh, as we tighten up each turn. As you get going with these windings, you get a bit in a groove. And uh, yeah, you just kind of get a process getting the wire in there and uh, pulling it down through, keeping it dressed tight up against the uh, winding you just did, and uh, draw them tight. So and that, uh, there's 31, so this is the last uh, turn through this toroid. So I've got all 31 uh, turns on here. We can uh, kind of squish it all down here on the, tor on the dowel and kind of get the turns uh, kind of evenly distributed around the toroid. Uh, just uh, kind of evens out the distributed capacitance and makes for a much neater look. Sometimes stripping the enamel off of these enameled wires can be tricky. You can use some emery paper, uh, sometimes you can use a, uh, an X-Acto knife to scrape it off, but you always run the risk of damaging the wire. And uh, a lot of these uh, uh, enamel covered wires can be heat stripped. And you basically just create a nice big blob of solder and uh, kind of embed the wire in the end of the solder there. And that will boil away the uh, enamel and leave you with a nice tinned wire. It doesn't work for all enamel types, but it does work for many of them. Okay, the transformer splitter is uh, wound with uh, eight turns on the primary, which I've already done here. The secondary is wound in a bifiler fashion, which is uh, essentially taking you know, two wires and winding them at the same time. So the easiest way to do this is to start off with a single piece of wire and just hairpin it. Uh, so you've got uh, the two wires together and then we'll twist these together and run you know, three or four twists per inch uh, and then wind this as a whole through the tor toroid. Okay, with the bifiler winding uh, prepared or the wire prepared, uh, we're just gonna run this through. We only need four turns or four passes through the, uh, the center of the toroid for these uh, secondaries. So I'll run uh, some of this through, pull it out. That's uh, our first turn and uh, we'll just run uh, the, the four turns through here. Okay, time for a little testing on the bench. Uh, the way the uh, quadrature mixing works is that if the input signal going into the mixer is equal to our local oscillator going into the mixer, the output will be DC. Uh, whenever we have a frequency difference between the RF input and the local oscillator, that difference frequency will appear at the outputs. So if we had a you know, 10 kilohertz difference between the uh, RF input and the uh, local oscillator, we'd get 10 kilohertz out of the output. Now the fact that we're driving each of these mixers with quadrature clocks, that means that the resulting frequency difference will also be in quadrature. So again, if we've got a 10 kilohertz frequency difference, we'll see 10 kilohertz here and here, except that those two signals will be in quadrature or 90 degrees out of phase. And that's what we're seeing here on the bench. What I'm probing here is the audio outputs, the outputs that would normally go to the sound card in the computer for, for processing. I'm probing those two uh, with the scope. And we can see uh, two uh, 10 kilohertz sinusoids on the scope separated by 90 degrees or a quarter of a cycle. And uh, the frequency we're putting into uh, the soft rock from the signal generator is 10.133117 megahertz which happens to be exactly 10 kilohertz off of uh, where the center frequency of the uh, local oscillator is. If I reach in here and adjust uh, the frequency up or down, we can actually see the mixer outputs move up or down in connection with that. If we go down to kind of match that frequency, we'll see these things get close to, close to DC. They're varying very, very slowly because I'm really, really close to uh, that signal frequency. But as we kind of move up here again, very easy to go see that. 
So that tells us that the basic circuit is working, we're getting the proper quadrature mixing, and these uh, IQ outputs going into the sound card would be properly demodulated. Let's take, okay, so let's take a look at a simple modulated result. Right now this is just a CW signal coming in at a 9 kilohertz offset frequency from uh, our local oscillator. And if I uh, turn the signal generator into a modulated signal using amplitude modulation, I've got a 1 hertz uh, modulating signal here, 50% modulation depth, and we can see the modulation of the RF signal being reflected in the quadrature baseband outputs. So uh, let's go see how that works with a more realistic modulation frequency. So if I change my modulation frequency to, oh, say, 5 kilohertz, and we slow the sweep speed down, we can, so we've got that uh, modulation going on in there, and I can see it very easily if I put on a fast Fourier transform. So let me turn off the other channels, and we can take a look at the, uh, the Fourier transform result here. So I'm just doing a, a fast Fourier transform on channel 1, because they're both going to be the same. And I can see uh, three frequency components, and that's very typical of a, a single tone ampli you know, amplitude modulated signal. Uh, that uh, center tone, if we move the cursor right to it, we can see is right at, uh, at 9 kilohertz, which is where we expect it to be. And these offset tones should be offset uh, by our modulation frequency, which should be right at uh, 5 kilohertz. So those are our upper and lower sidebands, and there they are, plus and minus 5 kilohertz away from the tone. So that kind of shows us that the modulation that we have on the RF input is translated down to the I and Q quadrature outputs. Okay, we've got the completed uh, Softrock Light 2 receiver up here on uh, the computer desk and uh, just hooked up to a, uh, a battery for power. Uh, the audio lead is running off to uh, the computer sound card uh, line inputs and uh, the antenna input is actually hooked up to my uh, dipole antenna out in the backyard. So let's see if we can find something to uh, listen to here uh, on the uh, HD SDR software. Okay, we're looking at the uh, output of the receiver using HD-SDR as the uh, software-defined receiver package. And I'm actually tuned to a CW signal that was riding along right in here. So like we've got another one coming up right here. I'll turn the volume up. Oh, he just went away as well. So you can actually see a CW coming out in the spectrogram or waterfall plot, and we can hear him as well. So it looks like this uh, Softrock Light 2 uh, SDR receiver front end is working well with this uh, HD SDR software and would presumably work with any uh, uh, SDR software that uh, takes input from the sound cards. Anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed watching the video, learned a little something about what the uh, front ends of some simple direct conversion uh, software defined receivers look like, a little bit about uh, uh, quadrature mixing and uh, the quadrature signals uh, that are generated by these uh, hardware front ends. And uh, anyway, I appreciate you watching. Comments are always welcome. Thanks again.